Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Mark Traeger, and I am the chair of the Committee on Recovery and Resiliency. We are here today to discuss the administration's role in reform of the National Flood Insurance Program and how we can mitigate increasing costs of flood protection in New York City. New York City has more residents living in high-risk flood zones than any other city in the United States. This is exacerbated by the fact that much of our property consists of older buildings constructed before the federal government's National Flood Insurance Program, or NFIP for short, uh, was established. Therefore, uh, homes and commercial property that meet building code requirements are not necessarily suitable for modern challenges like rising sea levels and extreme weather. The task before our federal government is a supremely challenging one. NFIP has become insolvent after severe damage uh, from Hurricanes Katrina and Ike uh, bankrupted the program, along with costs to, to recover from Hurricane Sandy, the NFIP has owed the U.S. Treasury uh, over $25 billion. If this debt is forgiven, uh, our coastal regions are still at risk of the next severe storm bankrupting the program once again. Um, and quite frankly, recently we just uh, experienced hurricanes in, in our country and and Puerto Rico, uh, it's, it's been one thing after another, and, and FEMA has not uh, been uh, secretive about the challenges uh, which they're facing. With NFIP set to expire uh, on December 22nd, uh, we must work together in promoting uh, new ideas to reform the troubled uh, program. We must manage the balancing act of assuring that homeowners are not burdened by unmanageable costs to keep a roof over their heads and with ex by extension, tenants as well. Uh, yet we must maintain a program that does not consistently uh, teeter on the brink of failure and burden of the public at large. The city has already won its appeal uh, to revise FEMA's flood insurance rate maps, which the agency uses to map uh, which areas are in high-risk flood zones. We believe efforts like this, as well as providing owners with means to elevate their homes and enforcing construction standards that meet and exceed FEMA requirements can help maintain property affordability for our residents. We also want to explore how NFIP can establish uh, an acquisition program and moderate uh, density in low-lying coastal uh, regions. Uh, in the wake of unprecedented storms like Hurricane Harvey, Irma, and Maria, it is clear we can no longer wait uh, for President Trump's long-awaited infrastructure promises to materialize. Uh, this administration and council must continue to lead resiliency efforts and provide a model for other cities by investing in coastline protection and studying climate change. As a committee, uh, we look forward to working with the city administration to urge Congress and, and challenge the White House uh, to, to do the same. Uh, thank you to those who have helped prepare for today's hearing, including uh, Vanessa Ogle, my policy uh, director, uh, committee counsel, uh, Malika Jabali, and senior policy analyst, Patrick uh, Mulvihill. Uh, the committee looks forward to hearing testimony from the Office of Recovery and Resiliency, uh, as well as other administration officials and, and community advocates. Uh, and at this time, I'd like to uh, call on the administration for the first panel. Um, and uh, I'd just like to first just make sure we've been, uh, note that we've been joined by Minority Leader Stephen Matteo, who, as always, gets the gold star for the committee, and as well as, as we've been joined by Councilmember Carlos Menchaca. So if everyone could please raise your right hands. Um, do you swear uh, or affirm to tell the truth and to answer truthfully to council member questions? Great. And just to note that the first panel is uh, we have uh, Dana uh, uh, Coach Kachnauer. I'm sorry, Dana Kachnauer. I'm usually good at uh, reading handwriting. My, my, my apologies. From the New York City's Mayor's Office of Recovery and Resiliency, uh, Janie Bavishi, Mayor's Office of Recovery and Resiliency, and uh, Will Fairhurst. Oh, he's not. Uh, that's for later on. Okay. And uh, do we have a card for? Ah. Okay, we have Anne Rebecca Kagan uh, Sternhill. Is that correct? Yes. Wonderful. From D.C. Yes. Thank you for thank you for flying in. This is a very very important issue. So, with that, uh, you may proceed. Thank you. 
Good afternoon. My name is Janie Babishi, and I'm the director of the Mayor's Office of Recovery and Resiliency. ORR is pleased to participate in this hearing about the National Flood Insurance Program reauthorization and preserving flood insurance affordability in New York City's flood zones. I want to thank Committee Chair Traeger, as well as the members of this committee, for the opportunity to discuss the city's efforts thus far. I am joined here today by my colleagues Rebecca Kagan, Deputy Director of the Mayor's Office of Federal Legislative Affairs, and Dana Kochnauer, Acting Deputy Director of Buildings at ORR. Back in June of this year, ORR came before this committee to discuss, one, the reasons why flood insurance affordability has become an increasingly common topic of frustrations, frustration for residents in the flood zone, two, key actions the city has taken to fight for flood insurance affordability at the federal level, and three, what we can do to help ensure residents will continue to afford their flood insurance in the future. We are pleased to be able to continue the conversation with the committee. I would like to reiterate that ensuring residents in the floodplain are prepared for coastal storms and rising seas through tools such as affordable flood insurance as well as neighborhood scale coastal pro protection systems are a prior priority for the de Blasio administration and are key initiatives un under our multi-layered 1NYC resiliency program. The city has been engaging with both the House and Senate since early 2016 to advocate for reforms to FEMA's NFIP. The city held meetings with key offices in both chambers to lay out our reform principles and to help decision makers think through potential policies. We have worked closely with Senator Gillibrand's office to help craft their reform legislation, ensuring that there, are, there remains a consumer-centric focus and that FEMA reforms simplify the program and consumer engagement with it. I will let Rebecca Kagan dive into the specifics of the city's work in Washington on NFIP reform, but I want to underscore that our approach to advocacy has been rooted in cutting-edge research. In February of 2015, ORR commissioned RAND to explore options to preserve flood insurance affordability. The findings show that the cost of flood insurance is already burdensome for about one quarter of households in owner-occupied one to four family residences and much more burdensome for lower, lower income households. Our work also recommended a means-tested voucher system as a way to ensure that NFIP remains affordable not only for low-income New Yorkers but for all low-income Americans that need flood insurance. I am pleased to report that Senator Gillibrand's bill, which Rebecca will discuss, includes the city proposal. Locally, New York City is, manage, is working to manage its floodplain to reduce risk beyond advocating for NFIP reform. Since Hurricane Sandy, the city has been working urgently to ensure New Yorkers in the floodplain are better equipped to deal with increasing flood risk with a broad range of resiliency tools, such as upgraded building and zoning codes and improved policies and programs. New York City's flood resilience zoning text encourages flood resilient building construction through specific parts of the floodplain by removing regulatory barriers that hinder or prevent the reconstruction of storm damaged properties. It also enables new and existing buildings to comply with new higher flood elevations issued by FEMA and to comply with new requirements in the New York City Building Code. The city is also leading a comprehensive community planning effort in 10 sandy impacted neighborhoods to better understand how we can continue to approve upon zoning as a resiliency tool. In October of 2016, New York City reached an agreement with FEMA to revise the city's flood maps, which uh, Council Member Traeger alluded to in his opening remarks. The revised flood maps will provide our residents with more precise current flood risk data in addition to providing a second map product reflecting future conditions that account for climate change. The innovative revisions will assist New York City in making coastlines more resilient and climate ready while ensuring homeowners do not have to purchase more insurance than their current flood risk requires. Last week, New York City met with FEMA Region 2 for the kickoff of the remapping effort. New preliminary flood insurance rate maps are scheduled to be released by 2021. New York City, in partnership with New York State, administers buyout and acquisition redevelop for redevelopment programs. These programs are designed to offer owners of properties affected by Hurricane Sandy the opportunity to sell their property. Through the buyout program, the city aims to improve the resiliency of the larger community by transforming parcels of land into wetlands, open space, or stormwater management systems, creating a natural coastal buffer to safeguard against future storms. As the city's flood maps are being revised, it is crucial that New Yorkers remain aware of their current and future flood risk. To ensure residents keep their home and finances safe, the city has launched a consumer education campaign directing, flood, uh, directing residents to floodhelpny.org, a one-stop shop for flood risk information. Public outreach is ongoing, and as the revised flood maps come in effect, additional extensive outreach and education programs will be provided for all communities. In conclusion, I would like to thank the committee for this opportunity to provide an update on the extensive work this administration has done to reduce flood risk for our residents. 
I will now turn the floor over to Rebecca Kagan uh, from the Mayor's Office of Federal Affairs. Good afternoon, and as Jane just said, my name is Rebecca Kagan Sternhill, and I'm the Deputy Director and General Counsel of the Mayor's Office of Federal Affairs down in Washington, D.C. Uh, I want to thank you, Committee Chair Traeger, as well as all the members who are here today for the opportunity to discuss NFIP and our efforts down in Washington to protect not only our constituents' homes, but their wallets as well. So New York City has been engaging on the NFIP reform since the moment HIFIA passed, or Homeowners Flood Insurance Affordability Act of 2014 passed in April of 2014. Following that fight, the city began to look at how implementation of the law would affect the city and what additional reforms were needed. The city engaged with homeowners, local organizations, um, and other jurisdictions throughout the country to develop a set of principles around NFIP reform. In early 2016, as Jeannie alluded to, federal affairs began engaging more robustly with both the House and the Senate on flood insurance reform. Throughout the past year and a half, Federal Affairs has held meetings with key offices in both chambers to lay out our reform principles and to help decision makers think through potential policies. In addition to individual offices, Federal Affairs has also routinely met with respective committees of jurisdiction in both chambers. Early on, we worked closely with Senator Gillibrand's office to help craft their legislation and, as noted, you know, ensure that it remained a consumer-centric focus um, and simplifying the program for those who engage with it. We've also provided additional technical assistance to the Senate Banking Committee on their draft legislation and contributed several red lines as they've gone through the legislative drafting process. As discussions around NFIP reauthorization began to pick up in August 2016, Federal Affairs and ORR staff presented the reform principles to key Republican and Democratic House Financial Services Committee staff in a bipartisan meeting. We had an engaging discussion where the city's ideas were considered seriously, and it was made clear to staff just how important affordability is. It's worth noting that many of the ideas are reflected, albeit not always perfectly, in the various House and Senate bills that were subsequently introduced. Federal Affairs and ORI staff again met with the group in March of 2017 to pre present the RAND Flood Insurance Affordability Study. Language from the study, as well as program design, was subsequently present in both House and Senate legislation. Following the release of the House legislation in late spring of this year, a package of seven bills, I was called to testify on flood insurance and the Republican draft legislation in front of the House Financial Services Committee this June. After the hearing, the city continued coordinating with external stakeholders like the Coalition for Sustainable Flood Insurance and the Realtors Association, as well as working with both Republican and Democratic offices on draft language and amendments and program revisions. Throughout, we have had a bipartisan coalition of members and a coordinated strategy to ensure the city's priorities are protected. In so doing, Federal Affairs helped facilitate a Republican-led letter by Representative Pete King's office to leadership that essentially tanked the House's initial efforts and got the city additional modifications and concessions in the House bills. Our New York members were able to get excuse me, additional concessions in the House legislation before it ultimately passed out of the chamber this, this November. Conversations with the Senate Banking Committee and leadership are ongoing as they worked through to craft longer-term solution to flood insurance. We expect the program to be extended as, a, <coughs> as is in the upcoming December 22nd federal spending vehicle, a continuing resolution, omnibus, or combination thereof. With regard to the House bill that passed, H.R. 2847, the city does not support this legislation for a host of reasons. While it does include some reforms we do agree with, it does not protect consumers or the NFIP enough. Our concerns briefly? It reduces annual increases in premiums from 18% to 15%, but raises the minimum increases from 5% to 6.5%, and rate increases have been at a minimum in recent years. And properties with two or more claims after the enactment of the law could be on an accelerated rate path um, increasing at 10% or 15% at a minimum. It does include assistance for low-income policyholders through state-run programs, but those are paid for with a surcharge on all of their policies, which could push some people into being housing burdened. Um, and it also imparts an additional layer of bureaucracy and government into the NFIP insurance process. Uh, the mandated use of replacement costs and premium rates in an accompanying study are required, but the study does not consider affordability, nor does the administrator have discretion not to use these rates if there are affordability issues or regional market distortions, as we know New York City is a unique market. Um, it changes definitions of repetitive loss and severe repetitive loss, causing more homes to qualify for accelerated rate increases and lose grandfathered status. It penalizes communities that have only a handful of repetitive loss properties with limited regard for community size, overall number of structures, or the cost in a community. And it encourages private insurance policies with no consumer notice provisions be utilized. Our largest concern is the elimination of the non-compete clause for the write-your-own insurance companies and the requirement that NFIP share their data in full with any party. Such actions might certainly bring more private participation, but it will be at the expense of the NFIP and its solvency. 
Past witnesses representing the insurance industry in both House and Senate hearings have admitted to quote-unquote cherry-picking the healthiest policies, which will leave NFIP with only the riskiest policies, thus further undermining its solvency. This will do nothing for the program's debt, nor for the residents holding NFIP policies who will see increased rates and fees. Flood insurance will become more unaffordable for those that can least afford the increase. Rather than this dualistic approach of sharing all of sharing nothing, the city worked with Senator Gillibrand's office to offer a third way, eliminating the non-compete for a subset of properties. Uh, these properties represent a smaller part of FEMA's book of business, and they can also be a proving ground to validate or dispel fears about cherry-picking FEMA's book. Um, the committee could also, we also recommend the committee could set a time frame for this review and ensure that it's validated by non-stakeholder third party and vest the administrator with the authority to reinstall or remove non-competes. This needn't be an all or nothing proposition at the federal level. In conclusion, I'd like to thank the committee for this opportunity to, to provide an update on the administration's efforts in Washington to ensure, excuse me, ensure affordable flood insurance for all New Yorkers. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Great, thank you. I just want to note that we've also been joined by uh, council members uh, Mark Richin and also Eric Ulrich, I believe, as well. Uh, so I, I want to begin by just acknowledging the good work uh, the city has done with regards to challenging the, the FEMA flood maps. That was, I think, something that we should definitely um, uh, take some pride in because it's not easy um, to challenge FEMA on some of this stuff, and I, I do want to uh, publicly commend. I know uh, the city's done a, a good job on, on that front, but we have a lot more work to do, and I think that's that's where we, we, we begin today. Now, um, the, the the RAND report uh, that, that was referenced um, on flood insurance affordability um, included some federal policy recommendations, right, as we talked about uh, means-tested financial assistance for homes that need it most and grants for low-middle-income uh, uh, property owners to make uh, the, them less vulnerable to flooding. Um, is this something that is, in fact, a part of the draft discussions in Congress, or can you, can you tell us about uh, where that stands? Uh, certainly. It depends on the vehicle you're looking at. Uh, the House bill that passed uh, 2874 has a low-income assistance, if you will, program in place. Uh, but it requires a state to create it and then to implement it and to fund it with surcharges and other policyholders, which in our minds is sort of backwards. Uh, they use, I believe, it's 100% of AMI, um, so it would capture a good subset of homeowners, but again, it's at the expense of imposing additional fees and surcharges where people are already teetering on the edge of being able to afford a policy. Right now, most people, when they buy flood insurance, that's between you and the insurance company, and hopefully, but you never need it, but FEMA, when and if you have a claim. This would now also insert the state into that relationship, just making the process more complicated. And as we know, in a post sandy context, it, flood insurance is too complicated as, it, as is. So in that sense, yes, there is a program, but I would scarcely call it that because of sort of the small number of people it would capture, certainly in our region, and then sort of the how infeasible it technically is. In the Gillibrand bill, there is a program that's modeled after the RAND one that would provide means-tested vouchers based on what is called the pity ratio, and I'll turn to Dana to explain some of these um, terms. And looking at the cost of carrying a property, whether it's your taxes, your income, a, a more finely calibrated tool to actually reach those who are the most housing burdened by insurance um, and making sure that we can get them the assistance they need and administering that through the NFIP itself so it's somewhat seamless for the homeowner. So I can just explain uh, the pity ratio that Rebecca mentioned. So that is a calculation based on um, the principal, mortgage principal, um, the interest, the taxes on the home, and insurance costs. Um, and the way that RAND determined was uh, if your pity ratio was 40% or higher of your income, that pushed you into what they called housing burdened. Right. <coughs> and so that was the House version, is that correct? The, the House version did not have this. Did not have Jill this. Jill Brandville did have this. Okay, and are they, uh, can you tell us the... St the, the status of the legislation generally? Right, right. So the, the House has passed this legislation. It was almost uniformly opposed by all the Democrats, um, all the regional Republicans, mm -hmm. with the exception of Mr. MacArthur, um, from Long Island and New York and New Jersey opposed the legislation um, because of what it would do to sort of our communities. 
currently in the Senate, there are a number of bills that are out there. There's a Menendez one. There is a uh, Gillibrand Cassidy bill that I mentioned. There are a couple of vehicles. At this point, committee is looking to draft an additional bill. Uh, no one of those pieces of legislation is going to go wholesale at this point based on conversations we've had. It will be sort of an amalgam of some of the good parts of all of them. Uh, I don't expect that to happen before the end of the year, just given the other things going on in Washington and the accelerated timeline. I expect they will just extend the program uh, as is and then come together to find a vehicle that can, they can actually reauthorize the program longer term. Have we, have we reached out to lawmakers from Florida, from Texas, from the Gulf states to make the case that this is not a partisan issue, that Absolutely. their residents are just as vulnerable, if not more, than also the, than ours? And can you share with us your discussions with lawmakers from both sides of the aisle from, from these states? Certainly. So we partner very closely with GNO Inc., or Greater New Orleans Incorporated, and they uh, spearhead the Coalition for Sustainable Flood Insurance, which is a nationwide coalition of jurisdictions. Uh, so we've worked with Garrett Graves' office, we've worked with other members from Louisiana, um, uh, Republican and Democrat, to sort of push this issue. Steve Scalise was helpful, um, who was the uh, Republican whip, in helping get some of the concessions for our various regions. Um, so through that coalition, we've worked together and then have gone to meetings ourselves uh, throughout New York State with Republican offices, Democratic offices throughout New Jersey. Uh, so we've worked very broadly um, at the city level and then also with our coalition partners to make sure that everyone is hearing from us. And have they been receptive? I think they've been very receptive. There is a cost consideration with much of this. If you want to be doing an affordability program, there's a cost attached to that. There are PAYGO rules within Congress that if we want to use money for that, we have to cut it from somewhere else. Um, there's various factions within Congress that would you know, love us to not do anything and would love to roll, as the quote, quote Jeb Henseling, I'd love to just th roll up this program and get rid of it. So fighting all those forces, how can we best sort of protect homeowners within that sort of dynamic where you have people who want the program to go away in full, people who are trying to do something, people who are trying to do something but are fiscal hawks about it. So it, again, it, it is a dance we are doing. We are trying to work with a broad base of uh, Republicans and Democrats from across the country. I think there is a recognition the program needs to exist. There's a recognition affordability is a huge problem, that this is going to continue to get worse. Um, but it's how we get to that point, and trying to ram through a bill nobody wanted in the House um, is now kicking it over to the Senate, which I think is taking a more nuanced look at this. So I, I'm cautiously optimistic. And, and it's not, something. you know, the reality is these natural, uh, you know, events, whether it's hurricanes, flood, flooding rains, uh, fires, the, the deadly fires we see in California, this is not going away. It's it's going. It's getting worse. So I, I just, and and quite frankly, I, I'll, I'll again. I, I've said this before. This committee. I'll say it again. Uh, you know, New Yorkers uh, stood with uh, Texas uh, and, and Florida, of course, and Puerto Rico and all the U.S. Virgin Islands during their during their challenging times. But there were lawmakers from Texas did not stand with us during our challenging time during Sandy, um, and and I just. You know, I, I'm just trying to understand what do they tell their residents that tough? Uh, you know, I, I, I'm just, I'm really just uh, shocked and appalled that they don't see the, the urgency here. This is not a partisan issue. This is this goal. Mother Nature does not pick Democratic or Republican or independent households to to, to, to damage. It, it 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 hurts everyone. And so I, I'm just, I, I don't, un, I quite frankly, understand this logic, but just to give context to the committee and, and to those who are watching, and uh, there are, we, do, do we have any uh, data on how many NFIP uh, policyholders we have in New York City? Do, do we have that data with us? Yes. Just to give scale to the size of this problem? So as of 2017, we have around 55,700. So over 55,000 New Yorkers have NFIP policies. And that's across all of the zones. So that's in the moderate zones, the X zones, as well as the high-risk zones. And you anticipate that that number will grow once FEMA finalizes its new flood maps. Is that correct? Well, if our high-risk zone expands, then the mandatory requirement because, will be in place. Right, because there were folks that lived in Zone B in New York City, and they were flooded during Sandy. So I think that Zone A will see a great expansion 
uh, and I think pretty much I've seen maps that pretty much my entire district is in the is in the is in the zone A. So this is a a, a growing already a big issue and a growing issue affecting thousands and thousands of people. It will affect even thousands more, and the solvency of NFIP is 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 in serious uh, question and doubt. You have all these disasters happening across the country, and they pull from the same funds. Um, now, and is it correct to uh, to say that the the House bill and the House efforts are geared towards privatization? Yes, I th that certainly uh, from Mr. Henserling and from the House Republican perspective. Yes, their goal was to try and get more privatization within the program. Um, and. And which means, I think in your testimony, you mentioned that that's going to lead to cherry picking. Yeah, I mean, they, they've admitted as much that this is a business. Um, and so they are going to take the best risk because that is the best business decision they could take. NFIP exists because of a market failure stemming out of the 60s and 70s and the floods then. And it is there, uh, operated somewhat like a business, but there for you know, the people who can't get insurance on the private market. And so if you have private insurance companies coming into the system, if you will, taking only the lowest risk or the healthiest policies, to use a healthcare analogy here, pulling them out of that risk pool, what NFIP is left with is the riskiest properties. Um, and from there, you undermine its solvency further because you are stuck with basically the sickest patients, if you will. Um, so for those reasons, we were vigorously opposed to this. You know, that's why we were trying to propose a way that we could test the waters on this, where you have homes that are severe repetitive loss, they're already paying risk rates, Let's let the private insurers, you know, not have a non-compete there. Try it, see what happens. If they're not willing to insure those people, you know what this is going to play out. They're going to cherry pick. If they're willing to insure some right. of them. Right. And, and, and that's in the private market. And mm -hmm. when you mentioned that we have uh, 55,000 NFIP policyholders, that's under the NFI, uh, NFIP program. But then you have private institutions that provide flood insurance in New York City. Is that correct? There are, there are some, it's mainly for commercial buildings. Is there any data on that you have with you? Or? Um, we, we do not because right. it's... Because there is an impact on small businesses here as well. I mean, obviously, our, we want our residents to be uh, safe and secure, but small businesses are equally a part of our community, and that's a, a, a big issue for, for them as well. Um, has there been any uh, conversations in Congress, whether the Senate or the House, about um, acquisition programs assistance as well. Because if their argument is, and I've heard this argument before, and I'm, I'm, I'm aware of it, that taxpayers are being asked to pay to repair or to rebuild properties that are known to be in uh, you know, flood zones or, or in vulnerable areas. Well, in the city and the state, they started uh, the, the buyout program to those property owners that were willing to, to participate in certain uh, areas. Is there any discussion from the federal government side about creating its own type of program using the NFIP program as a vehicle or, or some sort of vehicle to say that if a property owner is concerned with rising costs and the rising risk that they could maybe sell their property? To a limited extent. I, I think it's certainly something that's on the table, and I've certainly heard it in various conversations and in meetings. The difficulty comes in, and some of the things folks are having to work through, is one, the cost, because it's not sort of just New York City, it's nationwide, and what that cost would be. We certainly would hope that if you were going to acquire, you'd pay fair market value for a property. Um, right. To do right by that homeowner. Um, so you're reaching into the billions and billions of dollars at that point. And again, just with the nature of Congress these days and how you budget for that for new spending, we have to cut billions and billions of dollars from somewhere else. It's not something like in a disaster where you don't need to offset that money, which is how the city and state has been able to do it in that limited context so far. This would need to have a pay for elsewhere. So there's that issue. There's the second issue of who then takes the property once it's been acquired. So does the federal government hold the property? Does the locality? Does the state? Um, those answers can be better or worse depending on where you are sort of within the country. Um, well, if, and if you use their logic, they like to give power back to the states and communities. So it should definitely, <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, obviously I think that we need to beef up our resilience. And if these are properties that are already prone to, 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 to risk, you know, to, to other types of things, then 
we need the locality should work to build up its resiliency. And, and I think that's, you know, following their logic, they always say give power, power back to the states and to the cities. Is that correct? So that's it is, but not with money. <laughs> I'm sorry. Is this by the way, the city does have its own buyout program, and can you just share with us what we're doing with properties that we, we are purchasing? Uh, it depends on where the properties are. Um, in some cases, uh, we are converting them to open space or helping to improve waterfront access with those properties. Um, in other cases, if they, for example, um, uh, are adjacent to the, the Blue Belt in Staten Island, um, they're being converted to wetlands for that purpose. So it really depends on where the properties are. It's on a case-by-case -case basis. And, and are there conversations about like a community land trust or we are thinking about um, how you know how we would administer a buyout program in the future if um, if we were to uh, do this again, um, and those are conversations that we'd like to explore further through the Sandy Recovery Task Force that uh, you championed. Right, and, and I appreciate that. It just the one thing I, I will note is that not every community was initially advertised the option for buyout. That's something I, I did speak to Director Peterson about mm -hmm. in previous hearings that there was a focus uh, in a few neighborhoods in the city, maybe Staten Island and parts of Queens. But certainly folks in my area were never really told about that uh, until now, but now it's kind of at the end of the, end of the game. Uh, so, uh, but I, I think it has to be on the table because if, if they are worried about cost and, and, they, and they seem to be concerned about budgeting wisely, mm -hmm. um, natural disasters are here to stay. They're getting worse. So the cost in the long run will far, far exceed the initial cost up front. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, again, I, I, was, I was not a math teacher. I was a history teacher. But I, I think I know, I know the math on, on this one. Um, the other end of, 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 of dealing with this is that is the city you know, having conversations with our state partners that if Congress does not act in terms of providing assistance to folks who will be mandated to purchase flood insurance, particularly my concern is definitely with the new maps that are, that are set to release at some point with FEMA, Thousands of New Yorkers will be mandated to, to purchase flood insurance, which uh, they're not right now. And it will not be cheap. Um, are we having conversations or any types of contingency planning if the federal government does not act, does not assist, does not provide these types of subsidies, what we're going to do to help provide assistance to, to the most vulnerable families? Our current focus is on the, um, on, on the National Flood Insurance Program reauthorization and really advocating that Congress act. Uh, we think that's where the responsibility lies. But um, uh, we're, you know, we're several years away from, from new maps, um, so we have, other, we have more time to, to think about other options. Because in those coming years, we're going to face more pressing budget decisions. You know, everyone's anticipating that uh, the budget will get you know, more, more tight uh, in coming years and, and due to the fact of, of, of the instability in Washington. And, and so uh, this is something that we have to be very gravely concerned about. This, I, I don't want to just kind of punt this to three, four years down the road when I think we need to start planning, planning now. Because again, the most vulnerable communities are not just vulnerable to climate change and rising sea level, but we're, we're vulnerable to financial displacements, the displacements of people that just can't afford another bill. And that's, and also, we, we've been mentioning homeowners, which is obviously a big issue, but many of them have tenants, mm -hmm. and those costs get transferred to them. And also, I, I, I'm concerned about our small business community. Um, I also want to just turn quickly, and then I know my colleague has some questions as well, uh, to the issue of our efforts on another front, which is uh, connected to this, um, our resiliency funding. Um, I, we, we sat at a panel recently where we, uh, there was an, an analysis done uh, of the SIR report and how far we've come or areas that we still have to uh, reach, goals to reach. I mentioned that the former mayor's SIR report uh, that was adopted by the current administration was more of a vision rather than a plan because a lot of parts of the visioning said subject to funding uh, and it will be finished by now, which obviously is not happening. Um, are we having conversations w with members of Congress? And also, New York is very fortunate to have uh, a leader, uh, Senator Schumer. Uh, he has been a champion for us, I know, in many, many ways. But are we having conversations about trying to uh, push infrastructure uh, in, in to shape the infrastructure bill to include resiliency funding? 
uh, because, for example, I know that the, the, the Big U project in Manhattan, which I've called more of the half a J, because, because of the funding reality. It's not every, not every piece of that plan is funded. I, I, th I think we acknowledge that. Am I correct? Yes, I mean, I think there's still, and Janie can speak to this better, there's still right. certainly funding needs for across resiliency projects within the city. Uh, with regard to infrastructure, the, uh, the senator put out a, a broad plan, I believe it was earlier this year, that resiliency was a component of that, you know, with an eye towards the future that if we're going to build, let's build smart. Uh, so resiliency was certainly a part of that. At this point, um, I know that folks are working on drafting the larger bills, and I, that will be a democratic product. I understand that there'll also be something, whatever comes out of the White House. Um, that may or may not have a resiliency component attached to it. Uh, the big question mark as well is what happens in terms of funding there. You know, initially they were saying uh, $1 trillion, and then they started to walk that back. Uh, so we have considerations there. We also have considerations, and I'm digressing here slightly, with the tax reform and what that will do for some of our ability in terms of bonding um, and financing tools available to us currently, what the ripple effects might be. Uh, especially as we now turn our eyes towards an infrastructure project and what we're expected to be doing. Uh, so there's a number of sort of balls in the air, if you will, in terms of how we can deal with funding. Well, at the same time, we're still now going to be in a, a season of additional supplemental appropriations for the disasters Hurricane Harvey and Maria. And certainly Puerto Rico has some dire needs just for basic infrastructure, let alone other resilient buildings. So. We, we've made our case. They're aware that we still have needs here. Um, you know, we don't want to say this is why we can't have nice things. We don't want to just build half a J. Uh, we'd love to build a full U. Um, but those are other considerations that are sort of a part of this larger conversation, certainly funding uh, the disasters of this past year, and then looking towards what comes out of the White House for an infrastructure package and what they then expect us to do in terms of financing. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I want to just, I want to flag that obviously, um, uh, the, the Big U project is, is critical in, in, for a number of reasons for, for the city and Manhattan. Uh, I also want to point out in southern Brooklyn, we had to even fight to get included into a study. I don't know if you're aware that we were initially not included in the Army Corps study. Um, and, and I do want to credit uh, uh, ORR, Dan Zerilli, others were very helpful in getting us uh, into a study, but that's step one. Uh, we, we heard testimony from the Army Corps that they need over $4 billion estimated to implement that study from the Long Island to the Rockaways to Southern Brooklyn. They only have about $400 million in hand, so they're $3.6 billion short. Uh, do, you know, do you have an estimate of how much we need for the Big U? No, we currently do not have an estimate. We're still uh, developing concepts for how, um, how we might protect uh, the very dense urban uh, landscape of, of, of Lower Manhattan. It's a, um, a complicated area in which to um, build coastal protection. And so we're engaged with the community in developing uh, concepts at the moment. Yeah, I mean, I would say that, and I'll turn to my colleague, but I think we need to start getting estimates in place now because I think we have to package our priorities to Congress as soon as possible. I. I I am getting the sense that the infrastructure bill is taking shape at some point next year. Well, again, I understand that Maybe. Their, their, their priorities change uh, with a single tweet. Uh, so I, I, I get that. Yeah. But I think we, we need to just prioritize what, what is important to us. Mm -hmm. And these are areas that are vulnerable for, for a number of reasons. And, uh, and, and, and the sheer density of the population in these areas, uh, it just, it's an incredible, incredible sense of urgency here. Um, and uh, so I think we're, 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 we're short at least $3.6 billion in, in my neck of the woods all the way to Queens, and, and I'm sure that the, the members of Congress in Long Island are also concerned about this. Uh, we're short in Manhattan, where I think we're short in, I mean, I know that uh, there was a study uh, how to have a backup generation for Hunts Point, which is about half of our food supply comes from that location, I think there were there was some funding there to kind of make it more resilient, but I'm not sure if they need more more than that. So I I just think that we should be packaging our priorities right now to prepare uh, to, to to provide Senator Schumer's office and others. My office has engaged these stakeholders. We've had meetings, and I thank you for coming. Um, we will continue to engage. Uh, you know, my Congressman Akeem Jeffries has been very, very receptive. I met with Congressman Dan Donovan from Staten Island because he also has Southern Brooklyn. Um, and so we need to really sit down to kind of hone in on our priorities and then make sure that we are 
uh, equipping our members of Congress with everything that they need to to, to go to bat for New York and, and for our region. I want to uh, just turn over to my colleague who has really, uh, I really want to publicly commend her. She has been at, really at the forefront championing the issue of resiliency in, in her district and all of, all of Manhattan as well. And please turn over to my colleague, Councilmember Margaret Chin, for questions. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for your leadership on this. We need more funding everywhere. and. <laughs> With the way what's going on in Washington, I can, you know, we have to really support our congressional members and our senators and make sure that they're successful in advocating. It makes sense, as you mentioned earlier, if it's part of the infrastructure package, you know, then the money could be there. But I think to really look at flood insurance, how do we lessen the, the risks, right? So. What I've seen, like within my district, we have a lot of also apartment building. It's not one or two family home, apartment building that were damaged you know, by Sandy. And some of them, I mean, one of the big complex, um, Nicobaca Village, recently you know, got some federal money um, to now to kind of fix elevator, put in a generator, that kind of resiliency effort. And hopefully that will, mean that their flood insurance will go down because you know they're they're less of a risk that's what i assume <laughs> hope <laughs> right i mean that is one of the things we've been advocating for and certainly in the gillibrand bill and <coughs> the unfortunate thing about the house bill that went out was it packaged some of the seven bills and there was one we called the maloney zeldin one which looked specifically at multifamilies and co-ops um and to be treated um, in the same way as condominiums, and to deal with these larger multifamily buildings and to do additional studies on that, especially where you have density. Because one of the things we've continually advocated for was to ensure that FEMA actually gave credit for things like elevating mechanical systems, um, figuring out where their losses are when somebody has a claim, and if you can mitigate that piece, that should, as you suggest, drive your insurance rates down. Um, and we have collectively been pushing FEMA for additional data on this to help them make better choices and smarter pricing in terms of their premiums where we do have these sort of sort of immediate homeowner or building level scale mitigation efforts underway and then some of the broader community like neighborhood block level and then larger community scale initiatives that the city is engaging in I guess uh, the question relating to that is that I mean some of the building that was affected were not in the the flood zone map but we anticipate they would definitely be included later on so it's the city uh, with HPD and the resiliency um, department, are you really looking at really helping some of these uh, multifamily building to sort of look ahead and how to help them, you know, build in some resiliency effort now with some low interest loans or grant program to get them into that mindset to really prepare uh, whether they need to have, you know, generators or elevate their mechanical because some of the buildings haven't done that. Um, because, you know, maybe last time, fortunately, they were just flooded, you know, on the ground. And but next time, it might be even worse. Um, we've been focusing on education for uh, multifamily building owners. And so we have been starting really with the first step, which is becoming aware of the risks. Um, and then providing them with um, information about low cost, medium cost, and, and high cost retrofits that they might be able to undertake and consider, um, and then connecting them with resources um, either through the city or outside as well. So how do you reach out? Do you have specific um, buildings and or specific neighborhood that you're doing a targeted outreach to? Or is, how do people get those information? We've been working with, um, we have worked with, HPD has a uh, training program for uh, property owners that we've been working with them to integrate uh, resiliency content into that training program. We've also been working with the Office of Sustainability's Retrofit Accelerator, which focuses on energy efficiency. We've been working with them to build in resiliency content into some of their program, um, as well as, a, a filtering system for when they're when they're wor working with their buildings they're also looking at are they in the flood zone are they going to be um, 
impacted by flooding. And then we also have been partnering with enterprise community partners to do some outreach. Um, we, we've been targeting um, not only the city's floodplain because we are looking at a, a multi-climate hazard. So we've really been trying to target um, citywide. Um, just one last suggestion is that I know HPD is working with the affordable housing uh, stock. You know, they, they work with a lot of nonprofit and it's really, it makes sense for them to reach out to them and, and kind of like get them on the right track in terms of resiliency work. But what about also working together with other agencies like the Department of Finance? Because in part of my district, I have a lot of small property owner, um, like for example, in China, Little Italy. They don't get this information and maybe the city needs to proactively sort of reach out to them to when they get their property tax bill, you know, give them some information about how they can maintain their building and make their building more, you know, resilient and what programs are available so that there's a more of a proactive uh, approach to get to these property owners because they really don't know what's available to them and how to help them prepare you know, from right. for the ne next natural disaster that they'll be, they'll be okay. I think that's a great suggestion. <laughs> we'll be glad to work with you on that. It's just like, we got all these wonderful programs, just that a lot of the property owners don't know about it. And so we want them to make sure that they can utilize these resources. Right, and that's why we, and that's why we have partnered with enterprise community partners um, to really try and expand our outreach uh, to, to all building owners. Our multifamily flood insurance affordability study that we ran really showed uh, that small and, and mid-sized building owners, like you just mentioned, um, they're just, this isn't, this isn't necessarily top of mind right now. They're so busy trying to just run their, their buildings. Um, and so we really have been trying to, to reach out to that community as much as we can. And uh, another big resiliency advocate and a champion for his district, uh, Councilor Manchaka, has some questions. Thank you, Chair. And uh, and really, every member of this committee has been so great, and um, we're really thankful for your for your testimony and your work that you're doing today. Um, and I want to just echo that um, the statement, but also the continued cry for more for more funding. Um, and I will be introducing a resolution soon uh, just for the council to uh, affirm that want, need here in the city. And so that'll be coming soon. Um, but I'm kind of curious now a little bit more about, about the outreach that's happening and really trying to understand the goals that are being set, if any, about how, how, how you're reaching any kind of goals on outreach uh, for uh, uh, small family homes, apartment complexes, uh, co-ops, and you are, there's a there's a there's a need to go citywide, and you've you've kind of mentioned that as well. Um, how are you me measuring success in in that outreach? So uh, we launched a consumer education campaign um, in October of 2016, um, and that was citywide. And the call to action for that campaign was to send people to floodhealthny.org, which as uh, Janie mentioned, is a one-stop shop for flood insurance information and education. Um, we, the way that we measured that success was by how many people visited the site. And um, in the time that that campaign ran, it had increased visitors to the site, um, I believe by 90% over the previous three month period. Um, that campaign is ongoing. We work very closely with the Center for New York City Neighborhoods, which is actually running floodhelpny.org, um, and we support them uh, with um, our own outreach efforts with coordination on any sort of city events that are coming up. Um, we also support them through our social media outreach, um, and we've leveraged some city resources like uh, Link NYC where we can run some of the assets from that campaign as well. So, um, and, and just help me if, I, if I'm not understanding completely, but I'm not hearing a sense of 
of actual flood uh, or flood insurance applications or or kind of fully engaged and so tell me a little bit about wh where wh why we stop at at uh, website um, users or website uh, and and when are we going to get a sense about how many people are insured and is that is that part of the goal yeah that that definitely is part of the goal and and we've actually seen a large uptick um, from from Sandy until 2017, uh, the city has seen a 60% increase in NFIP policyholders. Um, however, and what's the total? So it's a 60% increase from a set time before. How many people are insured in the city? Yes. And is there a goal that you're trying to meet um, that's less than 100%? And and so I'm trying to understand. As you can as you can tell, I'm trying to understand where where we're putting resources, how we're thinking about success. Um, is it just driving people to a website and getting information? Um, I, I always ask about, uh, and, and so does Chair Traeger, about work around uh, immigrant communities and communities that, that are just buying their first home, for example, that uh, are, are, are English language learners and, tr and, and just trying to get a sense about everything that's happening at the same time. So I'm trying to understand about where, where the goals are and if you can help me understand what, what that is, that'd be okay. great. So, so the goals are to increase awareness and increase um, insurance coverage for people not only in the A zone, in that high risk zone, but also for people in the X zone or the moderate risk zone. So um, we, we work with floodhelpny.org because it is the best resource out there for getting people from, I don't know if I'm in a flood zone, to now I have the information that I need to go speak with an insurance agent um, and ask the right questions. What we have found in our research is that um, pretty much every step along the way in buying flood insurance is a confusing process. Um, and since we are not selling the product ourselves, we just want to equip people so that when they can go, they can they know what they're talking about with their agents. Um, when you go onto Flood Help NY, there's a simple address search tool like uh, Google Maps. You can put in your address, you can find out information on the effective map, and you can find out information on advisory maps, which um, show you what the preliminary floodplain maps look like. So you can really understand your current risk and your potential future risk. Um, in addition, by putting in your address into Flood Help NY, people can also find out if they're eligible for the state's program, which could give them a home resiliency audit, which means that um, an engineer comes to your house and does measurements and provides you with an elevation certificate, which you then use to buy flood insurance and at your full risk rate. Um, and so that's, that's one part of, of the process. And I understand what you're saying about it just being a website. However, um, providing this information is, is really getting people to that next step, which is understanding how to even talk and, and ask the right questions with their insurance agent. Um, that website also um, has a rate calculator tool, and you can even look and try and understand what your rate might be. In addition to Flood Help NY, we, um, we also go out into the community. We do presentations um, on flood insurance. We, we answer questions from individual homeowners to the best of our ability. Um, we also have met with the real real estate um, industry and we're working with the real estate industry. We've done presentations for them, trying to get them to understand the current maps that we have on the books and what might be coming in the future when we do get our new maps. Um, and we've also done a lot of just our own outreach um, trying to understand what it's like to go and talk to an insurance agent. Um, and we had done some mystery shopping a little while ago, which, which <laughs> has informed a lot of what's going on at the federal level. Um, when people are, are trying to get quotes for flood insurance, they're getting different rates, um, which again is why we think it's so important that people really understand what, 
what they're talking about when they go and, and speak to agents. Um, and we are working on doing outreach in multiple languages to really try and reach all of the communities um, around. And, and I, I noticed that the site only has an, a Spanish option, doesn't have um, Chinese or any other options as well. So we're, uh, and, it's, it, and it took a click to get to the Spanish right. piece as well. I, I just wanna uh, kind of give you a, a kind of general uh, if, if our goal is to, to really bring people through a process of understanding, and and I think it said it was said multiple times that this is a very confusing process, mm -hmm. I, I want us to measure how, how well we're doing in terms of folks landing on a website, truly understanding, how do we measure their understanding, and, and how many folks are, are, and it says like we are, we, or you said that we are increasing the number of, of, of flood insurance participants in the program, um, and and this has been probably been helpful, but I just want to make sure that that we're that we're constantly thinking about how we how we really measure that that ability for understanding uh, e with a we with website and remove every barrier possible so that people can understand how to do it and and allow people to leap into that opportunity to actually get get in, get insurance. And, and we were really lucky this year that we didn't we we didn't have. A storm, and but we're going to go right back into that uh, that trajectory uh, in a few months. And so, uh, anyway, thank you for for giving me the, the full the full scope of work that you're that you're working on. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Chaka. And just for clarity, uh, the NFAP program isn't for everyone. Is that correct? Can you tell me who is eligible to be uh, included in the NFAP program and who is not? Uh, the NFIP ensures those who are in the zones, mapped zones of any sort. Um, any other homeowner could have purchased private flood insurance um, as well. Um, but the NFIP also does not insure homes built over water. Uh, but is it for just uh, it's available for as far as yeah. multifamily dwellings? Yes, they have a multifamily program. As well. All right, so there is. Yes. So co-ops... The issue we have with co-ops is that because they are a business, they have to get a commercial policy as opposed to insure. Condos can insure individual units like homes, if you will. Co-ops do not have the same ability to do that. And so we are working to rectify that. That's something that started under Steve Israel uh, shortly after Sandy, and that is ongoing. Is that a part of the, of the discussion now? Yes, very much so. And do you feel that there's any traction? I do. I, Mr. Zeldin took that up in the House. Uh, Senator Gillibrand has taken that up. Um, and through all my conversations with the Senate and throughout, people understand that this is something that needs to be addressed. So this change c would allow co-ops uh, to be included in, in the NFIP program, and would it also allow them to receive FEMA assistance? Is that I'm going to make a correction here. Please. They are already allowed in the NFIP program. They, they are allowed. But the building itself as a business, as a commercial policy, not right. as a home policy. But can individual shareholders? Cannot insure their individual units they, at present. They cannot. They cannot. We are working to change that. Hmm. The now, same way co-ops are treated as businesses in the event of a, dis a storm and with how FEMA treats them as businesses as opposed to residential buildings. Because I, I've heard from some co-ops that they can't even purchase <coughs> flood insurance. No one wants to insure them. That might be... Um, it might be that their their homeowner's insurance is selling them not an NFIP policy. That might be a different. But are, are you, because this is not from individual, these are, this is from the board. The entire board would like to purchase flood insurance for their buildings, but they're getting resistance from the private market. H have you heard this? From the private market? Correct. Right. Well, NFIP is not the private market. Correct, but right. I'm, I'm just saying, but they, they claim that they could not get through to NFIP either. I don't have an answer for that in this. I don't, I don't know enough specifics, but okay, I mean, it, is, it is available for co-op right. building. Maybe I'll follow up with you about this particular property. But um, as you mentioned, the private market does already cherry pick to some extent. Is that correct? Correct. There's nothing currently prohibiting the private market from entering and selling flood insurance anywhere in the country right now, barring whatever a state regu insurance regulator says. They. Uh, do not have such clear, clear 
it's not perfectly clear to banks that they can accept a private policy if a home has to, a mandatory purchase requirement. Um, so what they really would like is to have perfect information and to be able to have all the past claims out on all the past history. I mean, that's what we talk about, that information sharing, because um, currently they have a non-compete with themselves. State Farm can sell you NFIP, but they can't just sell you private State Farm flood insurance. They would like to be able to take all that NFIP information and sell you a State Farm produ product that competes with the NFIP product. Is there a consumer watchdog that makes sure that people are not being overcharged with flood insurance payments? Because according to advocates and studies, <laughs> that 80% of those New Yorkers who are paying flood insurance right now are, are overpaying. And they don't know it because their insurance carriers are using old, outdated FEMA uh, information. That's why we're pushing for these um, free home resiliency audits so they can get the uh, uh, free uh, elevation certificate that could offset their costs. Is that correct? And But who is the consumer watchdog? to inform people that they're overpaying. The, the difficulty with some of this is that some of these homes have been in the program and are pre-firm, so built pre-1983 within New York City. Right. Um, so they don't have an elevation certificate. So their rate is being set by factors different than the elevation certificate um, based on, I mean, this goes back to the mystery shopping. Um, the elevation certificate is sort of the gold standard for knowing exactly where you are relative to where the you know flood, the base flood elevation is, excuse me. Um, and so if you don't have that, they use other factors based on, you know, sort of what you tell them and characteristics about your home to give you a rate. And then you can be within that rate. The problem is it costs money to get an elevation certificate. And that's why we have this program to help assist people get them. Um, so that's why perhaps you could be paying less and you don't know. There's also a chance you get the elevation certificate and you should be paying more. But we're finding, according to, to studies, that most people are, are paying more. That's because the pre-firm subsidized rate is a one-size-fits-all rate. It's not based on the individual property's risk. It's not reflecting that risk. So that, that pre-firm rate, it's called pre-firm because it's, it's pre-flood insurance rate maps. So New York City got its first flood insurance rate maps in 1983. That rate is based on when your house was built. If your house was built before 1983, you can get this pre-firm rate. It's subsidized, but what what research is actually revealing is that that rate is actually not cheaper than what your full risk rate m might be, and you need an elevation certificate in order to understand what that real risk but rate is. Many people have no idea about this. They they don't, and that's part of our education campaign is really telling people the value of an elevation certificate. It's about an eight hundred to a thousand dollar cost for homeowners to undertake themselves. Um, and that is part of the state's um, resiliency, home resiliency audit program, okay. that you can get an elevation certificate. Because I, I, I do have a bill that's being worked on in the council to certainly inform people of this, but also to try to provide assistance to, to uh, moderate low-income families for, because as you said, this is not cheap uh, yeah. piece of paper. Um, now, I know that the NHS uh, with the New York Rising program is doing the free resiliency audits in certain areas. They're expanding. We, we work to get them included beyond, but I think we still have a lot more work to do, especially <coughs> once FEMA does finalize these maps and more people will be will be uh, mandated uh, to get uh, flood insurance. But I, I really believe that this is such a, such a significant issue and there's just so much more work that has to happen. And the other thing I want to point out is that after Sandy, uh, we heard stories in our communities and also it was on 60 Minutes, it wasn't a secret, it was across the country, of insurance companies uh, ripping off um, uh, property uh, owners. Um, but I have to blame partially the NFIP program for that too. In FEMA, uh, because am I correct in my analysis that they incentivize underpayment to policyholders? The current policy is the result of an overcorrection post Katrina. So, generally speaking, when you have a write your own company, um, so these private, you know, the state farms and whomever, the right flood insurance companies. Um, if there it is found after the fact that there's an overpayment, they're required to recoup that overpayment. 
in Katrina, there were, it was found years later that there were many overpayments to individual homeowners, and it was incumbent upon the insurance companies to go and recoup the overpayments. Uh, you can imagine this did not go over well with individuals, with elected officials, what have you, especially if you're five years out, seven years out, way far out from the event itself. So one of the factors and one of the things and motivations, I think, with Sandy, we were the sort of the next big flooding event that had happened post-Katrina, was there was sort of an over-calibration to underpay so as to not have to go recoup. Now that's not the only reason, and I don't pretend to know everybody's motives here, and certainly there was some very bad dealing, um, but that was in part part of the issue, and some of the legislation then and ideas that have been floated about limit the ability of um, FEMA to go back and recoup how far back they can go if there is an overpayment is found. Um, so it's something that Congress has been looking at. Because basically, as you pointed out, if a company was found to overpay, the NFAP program aggressively wants that overpayment back to them. Right. And they will go after these insurance companies. But if they underpay, they seem to be not so concerned about this. I think we've made enough noise that they're now concerned about that. <laughs> They should be because they rip people off. And the, the other push that I that I was trying to uh, get across to, uh, uh, you know, our federal partners is that I believe that there should be some independence between the people that do the inspections and uh, and these companies because, you know, we heard reports that the initial inspector or adjuster that came out assessed that the property was damaged by the storm, and then. It traveled through the company's pipeline, and someone modified it without th that person's knowledge or permission, and said that there were pre-existing conditions before Sandy mm -hmm. that, and the company will not cover these these charges. And, and so I have to give a lot of credit to Nibia Velasquez, who had a bill to do Sandy claims reform, and Senator Gillibrand had a huge component of her bill, and that's one of the things we're pushing in the Senate, is Sandy claims reform to address some of these issues. Um, included in the House bill that did pass, one of the good parts about it was the bulk of uh, Congresswoman Velasquez's bill um, and another provision dealing with earth movement where you have this issue where they say, oh, it was earth movement, it wasn't the flooding, and that's why you have damage. Um, so it's something that sort of at a bipartisan level, uh, there is great interest in ensuring that people, especially with these latest disasters, uh, people get a fair shake. And I think post Sandy, as we then they reopen the claims processes, once this was all discovered, I think there with these new storms, I think they are implementing better practices. I think there's still a ways to go. Uh, so a little bit in FEMA's defense, I think they're trying to do better with these storms, but certainly uh, congressional action would be needed. But, but I will say FEMA still has a lot of work to do. Because uh, unequivocally. They also have to, with all due respect to FEMA, they have to learn the urban landscape. Because I've sat through a number of their presentations <laughs> where they assume that every house, every property is a detached house. Mm -hmm. uh, like we need to give them a little walkthrough of Coney Island, Canarsie, Red Hook, other part, the, the, some Rockaways. I'm sure there's some uh, row homes too. I'm pretty sure <laughs> my, my colleague Councilman Richards, who's here, uh, right? Uh, they. It seems as if folks who drafted their maps and diagrams are maybe from like you know Idaho, which is nice, but we are very different here. Mm -hmm. And have they acknowledged that? Are they making changes to their? They are starting to, and I will, I will give credit to a colleague who's no longer with the city, Catherine Gregg, who worked and Dana. Janie and myself have sort of sat with FEMA and pushed them, and we actually got in HFIA a provision of them having to do a sort of an urban, um, urban environment study and mitigation options for homes that can't be elevated. And so they took a look at it, and what they came up with was that they basically threw their hands up in the air, and we said that's unacceptable. So they have now put out another report of mitigation options available, and the next level now, as and we're pushing them, and FEMA's working towards it, is to actually tie credits premium credits and premium reductions to undertaking those various activities. So we are working towards that urban context, putting it at the fore again and again because these aren't just happening sort of in, in rural areas anymore. Um, I think even Katrina could tell us that. Now these credits are only for the recipient people in the NFIP program, is that correct? Is that what we're pushing for them to do? Uh, within this context, we're talking right. about if you're an individual, you'd like to buy a policy, you can get credit if you're in an attached row home and you can't lift your house. Uh, you can lift your mechanicals. They will note that as a you know sort of a little check mark in your favor and factor that into your rate and lower your rate as a result. So That's an NFIP. Yes, and we've been pushing for this. Carolyn Maloney and Mr. Zeldin had that in their bill that to, again to continue to reiterate the dense urban area and to sort of mandate those premium reductions. We're also working with FEMA just sort of on the regulatory side to do this as well. And we haven't gotten enough. We've made some headway. It is a long. Odaho, 
but we're trying and it's ongoing. It's just, it's fascinating that, and, and my other issue with FEMA, because I, I, you can see I'm uh, well versed in this based on, based on uh, a lot of years of dealing with folks from my district and others that have gone through literally so much on this issue. But when they do calculate their payouts to people, um, when people have to provide them uh, with, with the list of items that were damaged or lost, they base their estimates for, you know, for, for, the, uh, for, for, for the reimbursements on products and goods that might be cheaper in a different state, but are certainly not as cheap or not cheap at all in New York. Have they acknowledged that? Somewhat, and this gets to some of our concerns with the replacement cost value that the House proposed, where in some ways that might work well, but in high-cost jurisdictions like ours, there might be distortions. And there was not that consideration for them to not use those types of rates in terms of setting your premiums based on what they think the replacement cost might be um, because we look so different, because the costs here are very different than if you're buying in Iowa or if you're buying down in Louisiana. Um, so they're beginning to look at that. I think there is a renewed focus as well on having adjusters from a region as opposed to folks parachuting in from, say, throughout the country. We still obviously, in a disaster, need people to come from all over to assist. But I think they are looking more towards um, having local knowledge available to sort of be that front line of responding with claims. And I appreciate that you mentioned that because there are people that came from other states to mm -hmm. New York. But then the other problem is they don't stay here very long because many of them want to avoid New York taxes. So they might stay here for like six to nine months because I think it's, it's built into our laws and rules. If you're here for a certain amount of time, you have to pay New York taxes. And so I know this personally because some folks are working on and on a Seagate application for, for sewer damage, the FEMA person was there for a while and then is gone because of tax reasons. So have you heard this? I, I have not. I, I can't speak to that. Yeah, we have a lot of work to do with our <laughs> federal partners. I mean, it, 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 it really was stunning to me that how, what, what a lack of understanding at the core of the urban landscape from not realizing that we have row homes, mm -hmm. from using really just out of whack cost estimates for products, uh, for the cost replacements, tax rules, tax policies, you know, it, it, there's really a lot of, a lot of work, work to, to be done. I, I wanna just uh, conclude by, I don't know if my colleague, oh, Councilman Richards, do you have a question? Or, uh, but I, I wanna um, just conclude by going back to packaging our priorities to Congress with the infrastructure bill. I, I just want to make a comment, then I'll just ask for you to comment on that. I, cr I think it is critically important that right now we prioritize what we need from Congress as far as spending uh, on the resiliency front. And I think there needs to be a, a full engagement plan with uh, officials, uh, community organizations, community boards, as local as we can get. Uh, to have meetings and, and discussions about uh, to help shape our priorities and go back to Congress and to say we need these things funded. Simultaneously, we have to make sure I learned through presentations, as you can tell I've been through a number of meetings and presentations, that an Army Corps project might not necessarily align with NFIP standards to reduce flood costs. Is that correct? It may not necessarily. We are working diligently with them to ensure that, you know, so for example, the Staten Island Seawall will meet NFIP standards. And so there, I think there is a renewed focus. But there was a push to do that. Correct. I, I think we are a teachable moment in many ways with Sandy and what we're doing. Um, and so I think there is a renewed focus and interest on, on doing this and getting it right. If we're going to spend federal dollars, let's make them work hard. Are there any restrictions that you're aware of from Army Corps and FEMA communicating to make sure that the projects are aligned? There are no restrictions. No. So, it just some stuff seems to be so much common sense and just doesn't seem to be happening. So, uh, because that's another concern I have, mm -hmm. is making sure that we are protecting, uh, you know, life, property, mm -hmm. but also affordability, and that's the urgency of these of these of these projects. And I, I'm also a little bit concerned that we don't have yet an accurate or or an up to date estimate of how much we need. I do think we need to work through that. Uh, I mean, I have an estimate of how much we need for the Southern Brooklyn study, and also I'm not even sure if that includes the, I think it does include the Coney Island Cree study as well, but 
as far as the Manhattan side, as far as uh, I'm sure the other parts of Queens projects, uh, the Bronx and others, um, Staten Island, I'm not sure if there's any other additional studies. I, I, I know that the seawall is funded from the federal, state, and city. Um, but let's engage with officials at the local level. Uh, let's engage uh, our community boards. Let's engage our residents, organizations. Let's help shape the priorities, and then let's fight like hell to, to get these funds from, from Congress and, and to be a part of an effort to work with our federal partners. And, and again, I, I would be more than happy to work side by side with, uh, I'm not sure if there's a recovery resiliency committee in any cities in Texas or in Florida or others, but we would be happy to work with them, uh, that funding for their localities as well. This is a national, this is a national security issue. This is not just, this is not just some minor stuff. And so uh, can you commit th that, that we will, uh, you know, engage officials, you know, our state, city partners, <coughs> community boards, or local organizations to help shape the priorities and try to find, a, find, find a, an engagement plan to work with our federal partners to help shape this infrastructure bill, which, which we hear is coming next year. I mean, we certainly have enough information to put together those cost estimates that you're talking about to engage in this advocacy, and we welcome, we're, we're certainly prepared uh, to fight and advocate to get as uh, much as we can to um, solve these difficult and expensive challenges that we face in New York City, and certainly welcome the partnership of um, elected officials and communities in doing right. that. Right, and I appreciate that because a lot of conversation has been, which I, and it, these are tremendous issues as well, I'm not minimizing them, obviously right now, uh, we have many serious concerns about the current tax bill that's in Congress, and which does have severe consequences for, for our region. There's no question about that. We're also in a transit crisis where we need, we need, quite frankly, federal dollars to help us deal with our transportation network. There's no question about that as well. But this is a part of our infrastructure too. This is we can't treat these things in isolation. They, they are all intertwined and interdependent. So um, I, I commit. Our committee is stands. You know, we're already working. I, I'm already meeting with everyone that will meet with me uh, uh, about this, and I just we, we, we have to raise the noise level. But I also want to make sure that communities across the board are engaged, and uh, you know, from every level, and also every language and, and every person. We need to we need to help help shape this. Um, and if there's if there are no other questions, I thank you for your work, and let us know how we can be even greater partners with helping you make the case in D.C. Thank you. Thank, thanks so much. Our next panel, uh, we have Will Fairhurst and uh, Catherine, I believe, Hughes. Yes. Hey, there we go. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Will Fairhurst. I'm the Deputy Director of Housing Recovery at the Center for New York City Neighborhoods. Uh, I just want to thank the committee chair, Traeger, for holding today's hearing on housing affordability uh, and flood insurance, and we're definitely happy to be here for the opportunity to testify. Um, so background on our organization, the center promotes and protects affordable home ownership in New York so that middle and working class families are able to build strong, thriving communities. Established by public-private partners, including the City Council, the Center meets the diverse needs of homeowners throughout the New York uh, City and state area, offering free, high-quality uh, housing services. Since our founding in 2008, our network has assisted over 55,000 homeowners. Uh, we provide approximately $33 million in direct grants to community-based partners, and we've been able to leverage this funding to oversee another $30 million in indirect funding support 
Uh, major funding sources for this work include the New York City Council, Governor's Office of Storm Recovery, Office of the New York State Attorney General, along with other public and um, private funders. Uh, the city's focus on flood insurance and housing affordability began around the time of Hurricane Sandy. Uh, when Sandy struck, uh, our homeowner services expertise, our strong relationships with community groups and impacted neighborhoods allowed us to respond quickly and focus on short and long-term needs of homeowners. Uh, around the same time, the, the perfect storm of flood insurance reform with the 2012 Birgit Waters legislation, uh, along with New York City's flood map update process, uh, presented the need for homeowners to make crucial rebuilding decisions post Sandy, and two things became clear very quickly. Uh, first, that the rising cost of flood insurance posed major affordability challenges to homeowners in coastal communities, uh, and second, that there was an urgent need for consumer-friendly information about flood insurance. We documented these challenges initially in a 2014 report uh, called Rising Tides, Rising Costs, uh, and also developed an early version of the Flood Help NY website to provide basic consumer information uh, about flood insurance and allow users to look up indiv individualized information about their flood risk. Uh, over the last year, three years, we've expanded the center's climate resiliency programs. Uh, today, we offer services in the following areas. Uh, we have an uh, updated version of the floodhelpny.org website, uh, which is really a first-of-its-kind web platform that engages and informs homeowners about how they can protect their homes uh, from rising sea levels, from rising flood insurance costs, uh, and it, the aim is to increase not only literacy of flood insurance uh, and resiliency issues, but allow them to connect to specific tools that can help them on a household level. Um, to that end, uh, we offer the opportunity for homeowners in certain areas to qualify for free resiliency audits uh, and counseling through the Residential Technical Assistance Pilot Program. Uh, to participate, homeowners must meet income thresholds uh, and live in one of the following New York rising neighborhoods. Uh, so right now, Canarsie, Gravesend, Bensonhurst, Bur uh, Bergen Beach, Georgetown, Marine Park, Mill Basin, Mill Island, Red Hook, Rockaway East, Howard Beach, and Lower Manhattan. Uh, and we're currently in the process of expanding the RTAP program, which is the, the shorthand for Residential Technical Assistance Pilot Program, uh, to Coney Island, Brighton Beach, Seagate, Manhattan Beach, Gerritsen Beach, uh, and Sheepshead Bay. Uh, and eligible homeowners receive a free home resiliency audit, an elevation certificate. Um, the overall value of both of those services is, is about $1,800. Um, homeowners are then scheduled for a housing counseling session with a nearby community-based organization. Um, this is going along with the point of it's, it's a lot of very complicated technical information, um, provide an opportunity once you get a report in hand to sit down with somebody who knows you potentially knows your neighborhood very well to talk through what it all means for you uh, on an individual household level. Um, in the coming months, we're in the process of expanding our services to include a free backwater valve uh, installation program for qualified homeowners. Um, we also continue to provide foreclosure prevention services uh, to homeowners in all of these affected communities. Uh, this is something that we've been providing since 2008 uh, and has been a good uh, program that's gone alongside a lot of our resiliency efforts uh, is at the heart of all of these questions are uh, how do homeowners afford their home in the long term. Um, on the issue of flood insurance uh, renewal, uh, point out the National Flood Insurance Program is currently set to expire on December 22nd. Uh, it's due to, has uh, been due to expire twice in the last four months, only to receive last minute short term fund extensions by Congress. Ultimately, Congress must pass a long-term extension at NFIP that contains policy reforms that uh, we've been talking about today already. Um, such an extension has already passed the House. Now the ball is in the Center's court. Uh, so the Center for New York City Neighborhood certainly supports a long-term NFIP extension. Um, we will be looking for something that promotes flood mitigation efforts, uh, ensure that flood insurance uh, is available uh, and easy to understand for consumers. Uh, and ultimately also improve the NFIP claims, uh, claims process so that property owners receive full and fair payment uh, of the claims that they pay each month uh, the premiums into. Um, so we also believe that flood insurance must remain affordable for New Yorkers, both to encourage participation in the program uh, and to avoid overburdening low and moderate income property owners. Um, going back to the, the study that the city had done previously, um, the RAND study of one to four family homes found that 25% of homeowners in the floodplain currently struggle to afford flood insurance costs. Uh, this is the number that could increase to 33% when New York City's maps are updated. Uh, unsurprisingly, lower income homeowners are significantly more likely to struggle with the cost of flood insurance, uh, and two-thirds of extremely low income, very low income households face unaffordable rates. 
Uh, and as we mentioned earlier, measuring affordability at the 40% the uh, housing debt to income ratio. New York City's neighborhoods are highly susceptible to flood insurance rate increases uh, because so many of our structures were built long before we adopted modern floodplain management techniques. Um, many of our buildings were built before 1983. Uh, these are known as the pre-firm buildings. Um, a lot of these buildings now pay these subsidized rates. Uh, what that means is a lot of folks were locked into flood insurance before really the data was available on just how risky these households were. Um, and one of the impacts also of the expanding floodplain is that the neighborhoods that weren't in the high-risk floodplain before uh, didn't have to have that data uh, on just how risky their home was because um, the ocean ultimately didn't demand it. Um, now that it's becoming riskier to, to live in these neighborhoods, uh, a lot of the efforts about getting homeowners to not just learn about the process but also get elevation certificates is really a very helpful data gathering effort uh, from a policy perspective of understanding just how risky a lot of these neighborhoods are. Uh, and then on an individual level where you can really take that information and know, you know that my risk translates to costs of, of a precise value. Um, so I would say thanks to uh, the city's persistent lobbying efforts, we've succeeded in pushing back a number of proposals uh, recently that would have significantly raised insurance rates for many New Yorkers. Um, these included eliminating the grandfathered rates for properties uh, that are newly mapped into high-risk flood zones, um, so essentially not penalizing people who uh, moved into a place before it was risky and then environmental changes resulted in it being risky um, to allow them to not be penalized for those changes uh, as we think about ways that they can make their properties more resilient. Um, also pushing back uh, proposals to impose a minimum annual rate cr increase of 8% for subsidized rates uh, and prohibit NFIP coverage for new construction in the floodplain, um, all efforts that we think would have threatened affordability in these neighborhoods. Uh, I would also add we've, we've joined with several nonprofit providers, uh, including New York Legal Assistance Group, NHS of Brooklyn, uh, Brooklyn Long-Term Recovery Group, New York City VOAD, and United Policyholders to advocate for homeowners in, in an FIP reauthorization process. Um, we are seeking to protect affordability for working and middle-class homeowners, as well as promote investments in fund mitigation resiliency out uh, retrofits. Uh, we certainly invite the City Council to join us in these efforts. Um, so we certainly appreciate your, your support so far and, and look ways, uh, for ways to continue to work together in the future. Um, so once again, thank you very much and uh, it's certainly open to any questions that you might have. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Okay, uh, Chair Traeger. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Catherine McVeigh Hughes. I served 20 years on Manhattan Community Board One. More than half of that time as chair or vice chair. After Superstorm Sandy, I was appointed co chair for New York Rising Community Reconstruction Program for Southern Manhattan. I'm a founding member of CB1's Manhattan Tip Resiliency Task Force and a member of the New York Harbor Storm Surge Barrier Working Group. I speak as a 30-year downtown resident, I'm proud of what we built and we rebuilt, and deeply concerned that this investment made by our city and state and our entire country in Lower Manhattan is in grave danger from the threats of climate change, extreme weather events, and rising sea levels. What we've already heard today is that the future of the National Flood Insurance Program and its reauthorization are uncertain. Scientific data increasingly points to climate change as a major threat to New York City. Moody's. A major credit rating agency recently added climate to credit risks and warned cities to address their climate exposure or face rating downgrades. We do not know if or how much the federal government will assist in building our communities after the next Superstorm Sandy, which cost $19 billion in repairs. And some downtown infrastructure is still under repair, such as the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel. The FEMA Flood Map Service Center is the official public source for public hazard information produced in support of the National Flood Insurance Program. FEMA's flood maps impact flood insurance rates and are often the basis for the design and construction projects in both the public and private sectors. Therefore, accuracy is critical. In addition to the cost of accurate flood disclosure in the residential real estate market was recently reported by the New York Times, builders said their homes were out of a flood zone, then Harvey came. That was December 12th, front page uh, 2017. A recent Princeton University report stated that climate change will worsen inequality in our society if underserved communities become uninhabitable. Migration, some plan and some in panic, will stress already overburdened social welfare systems and infrastructure. The best way to mitigate these effects is to limit the greenhouse gases that are causing climate change. 
and is more important than ever for the city to be a leader to protect our roughly 500 miles of coastline. One way to do this is for the city to reduce greenhouse gases to meet New York City's commitment to the Paris Climate Agreement of 1.5 degrees Celsius. The initiative to make New York City the first city to mandate that existing buildings dramatically cut greenhouse gases announced by the mayor at the September 2017 C40 talks is critical to New York City to meet its 2020 deadline to deliver the Paris Climate Agreement objective limiting uh, temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Unfortunately, under current proposed law, intro 1745, local law to amend the administrative code of the city of New York in relation to green buildings, the New York City plan sets no deadlines in the next three years and will therefore deliver zero reductions from the 25,000 buildings affected by intro 1745. The proposed deadlines stretch to 2030 and 2035 and result in a citywide decrease of only 7% of greenhouse gases. The city needs to be a leader by starting now to dramatically reduce its carbon footprint, starting with city-owned buildings including hundreds of schools that are still burning highly polluting number four her heating oil. In the meantime, the city must construct a layered defense of local sea walls and regional surge barriers to address future storm surges. A 20 to 25 foot high, um, high offshore regional New York, New Jersey metro regional storm surge barrier would, one, Avoid the complex hydrogeological built infrastructure and social infrastructure issues faced by the current dual purpose New York City special initiative for rebuilding and design and rebuild by design projects. Two, could protect the metro area for the next 100 years allowing for long term change. Three, would protect far more communities than cur the current SUR and RBD projects for the same $20 billion about the cost of the $19 billion Sandy type storm. There's historic support for the New York Harbor storm surge barrier option. The regional storm surge barrier is one of the five alternatives currently being considered by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. New York Harbor and tributaries known as HATS, Coastal Storm Risk Management Feasibility Study. Both the storm surge working, storm surge working group and Nietzsche, um, National Institute of Coastal Harbor Infrastructure, advocating for serious consideration of offshore surge barriers as part of the layered defense. As a large investor, the city, um, and as the hub of the global financial system, the city needs to support the work of the Financial Stability Board's Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, known as TD TCFD, to advance climate risk disclosures worldwide. Series, a nonprofit, runs the campaign Disclose What Matters that spearheads a call from investors and companies to disclose material sustainability issues such as climate change risks in financial filings. Resiliency means much more than building walls at the waterfront. The greatest city in the world can overcome the challenge of climate change and show the way for the whole world. And I gave you a copy here, and I just want to make sure to draw your attention to the last page, the color of the map of, you know, the different scenarios. So if we lock in 1.5 degrees centigrade, it's the bottom chart is still pretty bad. <laughs> and, if, and if we go beyond that to 4 degrees, 7.2 degrees, you see a lot more blue of under flooded area. So if, if you go back to the chart here, which is the official sea level rise projections for New York City from the Sabine um, Institute Center for Climate Change Law at Columbia Law School, you'll see the graph. Which scenario are we going to lock in? So it's not only just building walls, but it's also about you know making sure that we reduce our greenhouse gas footprint. And the chart above shows why we can't backload, but we need a act now. Thank you so much for all your hard work on this important issue. I, I could not agree more that I know many people have uh, many ambitious visions and I distinguish vision from plan and then I, as a former teacher we have something called actionable goals where you have measurements and benchmarks along the way. Sort of like a, and and so that's what we need to apply here as well. And I, I cannot cannot agree more. And I, I would also say that you know whenever we we raise this issue, uh, you run into some folks who uh, uh, talk about economic anxiety about what that means as far as cost. And I think that you have spelled out with your maps that um, the cost that I'm worried about is that my entire district is underwater. 
And I'm worried. About, I love your district too. And I, I care about your your, your neighborhood. We're sitting as well. in my district. I care about every neighbor in all of New York. But I'm just looking at your your map, and all of almost all of my district is gone, and and it's underwater. So that's the cost that we need to also really be thinking about. And also, I I think quite frankly, if we think more boldly, there is economic opportunity in this sustainability and resiliency push, and that's why you know I, I've. At the micro level, I've tried to work with some you know, local high schools and say, rather than uh, work on building old car carburetors, focus. Let's focus on retrofitting your equipment to you know electric batteries and uh, more more green infrastructure, and to teach our teach our kids and, and how to be the, be the people to to build them and to install them. I mean, so I, I think that you're absolutely correct and. There's so much opportunity weaved into this resiliency and sustainability plan, but time is of the essence. I, I couldn't agree more. And again, I, I thank you for championing uh, many of the issues, and I know that you put so much time and uh, also in your s s tenure in the community board, and uh, we can't thank you enough. Um, and I just want to confirm uh, what I've heard from other advocates with regards to flood insurance costs. Uh, we've heard from research that about 80% of those paying now are in fact overpaying. Is that consistent with what you're hearing and reading? There are certainly opportunities to overpay, and I think one of the more common sources of that are where people uh, had a grandfather's rate beginning in 2012 when they started stripping the subsidies from the program. Those rates started going up uh, at a fixed annual rate um, or a fixed annual cap. And so lots of people, uh, particularly who are in the current high-risk flood zone, saw beginning of that time they open their their mail for renewal and suddenly their flood insurance rates have jumped up uh, if they don't have an updated elevation certificate it basically means they don't know where it stops and it means their insurance company doesn't know where what their full risk rate is um, and so they might just raise their rate every year uh, until they show them that there is a cap that they should have stuck to um, so for people in the high risk flood zone today which is the 2007 maps um, if you get an elevation certificate, you can show your insurance company this is as high as it'll get. If you find out that you're paying less than that, that's great news. You can start planning for uh, a potential future where it could get that high. Um, we obviously hope that it, it doesn't. We come up with a lot of smart mitigation measures. Uh, but if you do get that elevation certificate and realize that my you know, full risk rate is actually less than I'm paying, which we've absolutely seen in a lot of the resiliency audits coming back, those people could immediately present that new elevation certificate to their insurance company. Uh, and once they get to their full risk rate, it's a rate that really shouldn't change very much. Uh, so there are a lot of people right now that could benefit from the elevation certificate. It gives them a stopping point. It could give them some immediate financial relief. Um, if you're still in one of the moderate risk flood zones, it's really good information for the future. Uh, a lot of those people are still trying to lock into some of the low preferred risk rate policies. Uh, but it is still gives them a good glimpse of, of where things can be going. And uh, the same thing if they find out that they're you know, only maybe a foot away from their base flood elevation, an elevation certificate can be great ammunition to take back to their insurer and say, now, juice it. But you're claiming that these, these insurance companies are raising the rates not knowing what the cap is. Is that correct? I think you're being very nice to them. <laughs> because I believe that some insurance companies are very much aware of what they're doing. And so my other concern, which I, I did raise with the panel, the first administration, is, is there a consumer watchdog? Is there someone that is watching these companies and ringing the alarm when we're seeing patterns of people being overcharged? Because, you know, a lot of the, of the discussion today is how to, you know, uh, keep the solvency of the NFAP program and how to keep it for the long term and also try to deal with the issue of uh, these resiliency projects and funding for them and also trying to reduce our carbon footprint. I get that. But who's watching the private market making sure that they're not overcharging people? And I think they are. And, and not certainly not to let them off the hook and, and certainly as you know, an advocate myself and somebody who's, who's worked one-on-one -on -one with homeowners before, it, it's an incredibly heartbreaking and frustrating situation where you know you know that somebody is is being taken advantage of in some cases uh, the companies that that sell it are uh, a lot of the write your own companies which make up about 90 percent of the market they are regulated in the state as insurers um, you know I can say on uh, with a lot of the community-based organizations that 
Uh, we try and encourage them to work one-on-one -on -one with homeowners on these issues. Uh, you can get a lot of traction by, as an advocate, calling somebody's insurer, uh, explaining what you feel the discrepancy is, uh, and a lot they will make those corrections if they're wrong. Um, it's not as perfect as, as the industry uh, acting, uh, behaving correctly all the time. Um, it's certainly a reason why we think you know, we want a multi-pronged approach where not only are we making the people purchasing the policies more educated about the subject, um, but we really think a crucial piece is to also educate the network of a lot of the providers, financial services providers, housing counselors, legal services, so that they're knowledgeable about it so they can tell their clients what should, they should be looking out for. Because if this is accurate, if 80% of our New Yorkers paying fund insurance are overpaying, that's a major issue. And I just, I'm trying to figure out, in addition to educating our residents about making sure that they're paying the right amount, where's the accountability? And where are the consequences for companies doing this? I mean, granted, you're saying some of them might not be aware of the cap and but where's the accountability, and, and what can we do? Do you have any recommendations or suggestions for lawmakers on how to rein them in and, and how to create a, more accountability in the system? Um, I think we, that's certainly something we, a discussion we want to keep open, because I, I think the more information we gather from uh, the types of, of uh, abuses that homeowners see you know, from their insurers, if they do get things wrong, um, a lot of what we get from these programs is a lot of that information which informs this conversation. Um, you know, right now, you if you do catch your insurer uh, giving you an incorrectly rated policy, you can get a, re a reimbursement within that policy term. That obviously means you need to be uh, quickly educated within your policy term. Uh, and if you find out that you were overcharged years ago, then you could be out of luck in some cases. Uh, I know that's definitely been a topic for discussion in a lot of the reform efforts uh, at how long that window exists for when somebody could be refunded for, uh, you know, a wrongfully rated policy. Um, but that window is, you know, I, I think we've certainly seen cases where we wished it was longer, and, and I think ultimately we want to avoid that to begin with. Um, so I, I do think, you know, we, we view there are multiple stakeholders on our side. We think that it is important for everybody just to know exactly, as you said, that not only are these problems out there, but they're really, really large. Um, and we really need to, to make sure that, uh, you know, the community consumer-focused advocates are really aware and make this a priority of now, are, are you seeing or hearing any uh, difficulty in property owners or business owners getting flood insurance right now? And do you, do you expect this problem to get worse? It, it is true, and what, uh, you know, to echo what uh, Representative from ORR said earlier, everybody within New York City should be able to buy a policy. Uh, I agree. I've also heard that statement from homeowners before saying that they called their insurer and were told that they couldn't. Um, it probably does get a little bit on a case-by-case -case basis why specifically they were given a reason for denial. Uh, for large commercial buildings, there is a cap on commercial coverage for an FIP at, at half a million dollars. So if you're a very large building, you probably are shopping in the private market, and, and that could be true. But um, I, I think to, to the point, I, I think we, we hear things, uh, we certainly collect information of hearing things from insurers that we don't think are correct. Um, we encourage people to shop uh, between uh, NFIP providers in the private market, uh, and we encourage them to get in touch with one of their you know, trusted advocates in the neighborhood because a lot of times um, people hear things that are wrong, uh, and, and it really is important for them to, to get together with an advocate and, and to try and educate themselves so that they, they don't get taken advantage of. Right, and I would just also, as far as education, getting the right policy and, and the, the right cost, but also understanding the policy because we've also heard stories where insurance companies try to play games with defining what the hurricane is. Uh, some, some, if it suits their purpose, they'll say it's a wind event. If it suits their purpose, they'll say it's a rain event. Uh, people suffered a combination of both wind and flood damage, and so they play games on, on that front. Uh, and we see those games being played in other parts of the country right now a, as we speak. So, uh, but, but a lot of these things are, are regulated by, by Congress, is that correct, by the federal government, and is that right? There, there is a standard flood insurance policy, um, but I, I think, you know, to, to your point, it, it is important to start a lot of these discussions at what is flood insurance? Uh, why is it different than your regular homeowner's policy? You know, your bank may be forcing you to buy it, which means that you may not really have to understand what, in some cases, they're purchasing for you, uh, but it can really, really matter in the case of, you know, a large storm event like Sandy. Um, 
And so a lot of the education for this is it, it can certainly go as complex as, you know, here's how you elevate your mechanicals, here's how it affects your premium rating. Um, but it doesn't have to get that complex before it, it can be really helpful for people just to understand this is a, you know, single uh, loss policy. This is, uh, you know, just for flooding. This is how it's different from my usual household costs. Um, and this is why it matters. You know, I think you know, there's, there's a lot of language about flood insurance that makes people think sometimes that they're at less risk than they really are. Um, but 30-year mortgage, almost a one, one in four chance of seeing a 100-year flood event. Uh, another game they played, because I, I, I can go through the laundry list here, is saying that the locality sewer system is broken. And that's not then their fault. Because, so that's a whole, because a flood is a flood, right? You would think it's a flood, <laughs> but some of them will, anything they could look to kind of hook, to hang their hat on, uh, to kind of, you know, punt away any type of liability, they do. So I've heard stories about, I've heard about the sewer story too. For sure, and uh, you know, sewer backup is something that you can get covered under a homeowner's policy. It's usually an endorsement on the policy, so you do have to know that you're looking for it. Um, and of course, you, you know, you get into these insurance definitions of words that you think are fairly common sense, and, and suddenly clear lines start getting drawn. And it's, it's important to know, you know, that they're using a term in a very specific way and, and right if you know they, they can catch you in um, in very unfair ways if if you're not prepared ahead of time. Right, and I'll close by saying, first of all, I can't thank you enough for your outstanding work uh, from the beginning. Uh, but I, I, I think there needs to be some sort of a consumer watchdog here to really, uh, you know, to, to, to look for these trends, to catch them early, to notify the public, ring the alarm, hold them accountable. Because right now we're kind of doing this kind of by, as you say, case by case or even piecemeal. But there's no kind of cohesive, coordinated uh, effort uh, I see from the government side to really to rein these practices in. But again, I, I can't thank both of you enough. And I think that's, that's about it. Uh, we're the only folks here in this room. And uh, with that, uh, I thank you for, for your time. And if there's no, no other uh, witnesses, we will adjourn this hearing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.